Lord be with you. My name is Pastor Jennifer, and it's my joy to welcome all y'all to worship here at UBC this morning. We are an inquisitive, inclusive community of faith, and we are so glad you are worshiping with us. As we get underway, I'll offer a few reminders. So for our guests and our visitors, we have um, cards in the pew backs. And so if you want to um, hear from me or connect more deeply, I'd encourage you to fill that out. Drop it in the offering box, either in the front or in the welcome area on your way out. I'd love to get to know you better. Also, we take up our offering um, by those boxes. We don't pass the plate in the service. And so if you would like to give, you can give there. This Wednesday kicks off our fall programming. And so we will start off with our Celtic service. It'll be here at about 535 in this room. And so that service is a more reflective service. We use cause music. Our theme will be creation. And so we'll have that worship service first and then our potluck meal following afterwards. Then August 9th, our small group studies are kicking off. And so you can sign up for either How to Fight Racism by Jamar Tisby or a book study on What If It's Wonderful. So you can Google those, figure out which one fits best. And that's just for six weeks. So it's an easy kind of short commitment um, to dive deeper with our community. We're also updating our church family directory. So get Sheen an updated photo if you can. It's super helpful to be able to put names and faces together. And so we'd appreciate that greatly. We also, um, in the hallway back here next to the coffee, we have a Jonah coloring station. And so there's a big poster of Jonah. And so it's for everyone, all ages. And so after the service or sometime in the next week, if you'll stop by, color in a section um, together, it tells the whole story of Jonah that we've been going through. Finally, I want to say a, a big thank you to Martha Ginn who made it possible for us to update our gallery wall coverings. We are now museum level. And so it is so wonderful to be able to have that, but also it's gonna ensure that we're able to display art long-term without a significant damage to our walls. So it's both practical and beautiful. And so if you get a chance just to thank her for her gift, um, we are so appreciative of that, Martha. With that said, let's Take a moment to refocus our energy and our spirits on the God who is among us as we listen to our praise.
please join me in the call to worship. Calling all children of the living God, the gospel is good news for every age and every stage. The good news is proclaimed in God's words and also is with crayons, silly songs, snacks, and rest time. Let us worship together every generation. We come together with different abilities and disabilities, learning in a rainbow of ways and styles. Let us worship together with our family of faith. All are welcome in the arms of Christ who proclaimed, let the children come. Let us worship together, united in our eternal hope. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 48, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
we give thanks to you for all the gifts you freely bestow upon us, for the beauty and wonder of your creation, for all that is gracious in our lives, revealing the image of Christ, for our daily food, drink, our homes, and our families and friends, for minds to think, hearts to love, and hands to serve, for health and strength to work, and leisure to rest and play. And above all, we give thanks for the great mercies and promises given to us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our first Old Testament lesson comes from Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It's on your pew Bible page 849. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
forward to the front of the sanctuary. We can bless it later. That's okay. Um, these backpacks are going to hold so many things this year. New pencils, notebooks, and folders, art projects, and books, report cards, and permission slips, lunch boxes, and locker co combinations. Backpacks are something which you will be carried every day. So we, as a church community, are going to bless them together. We want our kids to remember when your backpacks are light or when they're heavy. The most important thing that you will carry this year is our love. We expect our kids to share that love with others. So each of you this morning are going to be given this card. Can anybody read this? Okay. Blessed to be a blessing. And that's our hope for you this year. And so I'm going to invite all of our folks in our church, whether they're in the choir or in the pews, to extend a hand just a second. Can we wait till after the prayer? Okay. So I'm going to invite all of our folks to extend a hand as I pray for the backpacks, okay? All, please, hold on to your backpack, okay? All loving God, today we give thanks for a new school year. We give thanks for new beginnings and new possibilities. Bless our kids with curiosity, understanding, and respect. Bless them in their studies that they may become wise. Help them remember making mistakes and trying again is a blessing, too. Build them up in our love to be encouragers in their hallways and light in their lunchroom. We ask your blessings on these backpacks. Every time they carry them, help them remember our congregation's love for them. May it surround them on difficult days. We pray in the name of Jesus, who was once a student, too, and ask his thirst for knowledge become ours. Amen. All right, so come get a card for your backpack, and you may return to your seats in the center. Well, thank you so much. All right, so now we are going to say together um, our Lord's Prayer, and just for any of our folks, want to grab one for a kiddo, if you've got a grandkid or a neighbor, um, feel free to grab one of these after the service and share them in their backpacks. So let's pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we Please remain standing and join us in singing hymn number 41, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. we 
which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in his blood. But we make his love too narrow by false limit of our own. And we magnify his strictness with the zeal he will not own. For the love of God is broader than the measure of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we could take him at his word, and our lives would be more loving in the likeness of our Lord. Our second scripture reading this morning is a continuation of Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. I will be reading from Robert Alter's translation, but you can follow along in your pew Bible on page 849. And Jonah went out of the city and sat down to the east of the city and made himself a shelter there and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would happen in the city. And the Lord God set out a great plant, and it rose up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to save him from his evil plight. And Jonah rejoiced greatly over the plant. And God set out a worm as dawn came up on the morrow, and it struck the plant, and it withered. And it happened as the sun rose that God set out a slashing east wind. And the sun struck Jonah's head, and he grew faint and wanted to die. And he said, Better my death than my life. And God said to Jonah, Are you good and angry over the plant? And he said, I am good and angry to the point of death. And the Lord said, You, you had pity over the plant for which you did not toil and which you did not grow, which overnight came and overnight was gone. And I, shall not I have pity for Nineveh, the great city, in which there are many more than 120,000 human beings who do not know between their right hand and their left, and many beasts. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The past two days, John Mark and I spent in the town, bustling town of Enterprise, Alabama. We drove over on back highways and we only hit a little stretch of interstate just once. And we were there for a family member who was retiring after 20 years in Army aviation. And so while we were in town, I had done some reading about Enterprise, Alabama, and I found out that it is the only place in the entire world that has a statue dedicated to a pest, to an insect pest called the bull weevil. And so I was determined to see the statue. And so with John Mark and my father-in-law, we made our way downtown Enterprise, and the statue's in the middle of an intersection. And so we had to walk through traffic to get to her. She was carved in Italy. It's this beautiful woman, and she is holding up a bull weevil insect. And you might be wondering, now why on earth would this town have this statue of something that utterly decimated the cotton crops? Because in 1918, it hit the South 
and it just destroyed all of the cotton. And so the people have a statue celebrating this happening to them, all of their crops failing. Why? Well, the story goes that once cotton was all gone, they actually had room to grow something new, a different kind of crop that was taking off called peanuts. And peanuts, pound for pound, made so much money that in a single year, most farmers' debts were paid off. And so this disaster that had happened to them became something that they then celebrated. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about this text in Jonah, because a disaster nearly happens, and yet Jonah cannot celebrate. He is not happy about it. The Latin term for this is the sermon title this morning. It's a happy accident. Instead of being my bad, it's, it's my good. Philippe's culpa. And so this happens in the story of Jonah. Now, we've spent the past several weeks, this is the last Sunday, I promise, that I'm going to be talking about him. This book is only 48 verses. But as we get underway, I think it's important for us to recognize something that I have mentioned, and I want to dwell a bit on a detour this morning, and that's the fact that Jesus compares himself to Jonah. Jonah is the only prophet that Jesus does this directly with, and it's so fascinating because what we've learned from Jonah is he's not exactly your ideal person you want to be modeled after. He flees from the call of God. He gets overthrown out of the boat. He gets swallowed by a fish. He preaches a lousy five-word sermon that saves the entire city of Nineveh. And now he's angry, angry to the point of death. Just kill me now. And so I want to step back and read that section in Matthew for us. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah. And see, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is saying that he is actually greater than Jonah. And so as I was thinking about this, I, I reached back and did something fairly nerdy. I went to the church fathers. What did they think about Jesus comparing himself to Jonah? And I think it's a good framework for us to hold on to. And so Cyril of Alexandria says, if Jonah then is taken as a type of Christ, he is not so taken in every respect. He was sent to preach to the Ninevites, but he sought to flee from the presence of God. And he is seen to shrink from going to the east. The Son was also sent from God the Father to preach to the nations, but he was not unwilling to assume this ministry. The prophet appeals to those sailing with him to throw him into the sea, and then he was swallowed by a great fish, and then after three days he was given back, and afterwards he went to Nineveh and fulfilled his ministry. But he was embittered beyond measure when God took pity upon the Ninevites. Christ, on the other hand, willingly submitted to death, he remained in the heart of the earth, and he came back to life afterward and went up to Galilee, commanded that preaching to the Gentiles should begin. But he was not grieved to see that those who were being called to acknowledge the truth were being saved. And this is really interesting, and I want our prime timers to hear this, because we just had this lecture on bees. Thus, just as the bees in the field, when flitting about the flowers, always gather up what is useful for the provision of the hives, so we also, when searching in the divinely inspired scriptures, need to always be collecting and collating what is perfect for explaining Christ's mysteries and to interpret the word fully without cause or rebuke. 
And so that's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to be like honeybees. I want us to collect here out of this sermon series of Jonah what we need for the building up in Christ. And so I was thinking about this, and I decided I would be an old-school Baptist preacher this morning. And I would have three points that all start with the letter P to help us remember. And so the first thing that the book of Jonah teaches us is about prayer. Every single chapter of Jonah, all four of them, have a prayer in them. And it's a prayer of a different type. So in chapter 1, there's a prayer of supplication. And in chapter 2, Jonah offers a prayer of thanksgiving. In chapter 3, there's a prayer of confession the Ninevites make. And in chapter 4, we get Jonah's prayer of lament. And something interesting here is chapter 1, the prayer is by the pagans. In chapter 2, it's by Jonah. Chapter 3, it's by the pagans again. Chapter 4, it's by Jonah. And so here we have a God who hears all prayer, no matter who says them. And so my first question for us this morning is, what kind of prayer does your life need right now? Are you in a season of thanksgiving? Are you in a season of lament? Is there something you need to confess? Is there something you need to ask for? Perhaps something that's worrying you or weighing on your heart, but you've just not said it to God yet. Jonah, through and through, is a book about prayer. The second thing that Jonah teaches us is about taking things personal. That's our second P letter. Jonah is angry about what's happened. He basically says, I told you, God, this was going to happen. And God says, why are you mad, bro? That's Jennifer's translation. (laughs) And Jonah goes out of the city. He wanted to see the destruction, and he's so mad at God. And then we get this strange vignette of 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 a plant growing up. And if you wanted to know, it's probably a calabash plant, which is our leaves up here this morning, or perhaps a gourd, but both were fast growing. And so the plant grows up over Jonah, and then God sends a worm to destroy it, and God sends wind, and everything in the story of Jonah does God's will except Jonah, right? All of creation, the fish the sailors, everybody else, but but Jonah cannot get with the program of God. And so Jonah takes it personal that God has destroyed this plant. He's so mad about it, he wants to die all over again. He says, just take me out now, God. This is unbearable. I'm hot. You were compassionate. I'm over it, right? And the funny thing is, God often uses nature to communicate messages. And so had Jonah not taken things so personal, he may have stepped back and wondered, what does this mean? What is God trying to communicate here? Because actually, all of the rabbinic studies understand that the plant represented Nineveh. And while God had issued a stay of execution, issued mercy in face of their repentance, ultimately, Nineveh would be destroyed. Historically, we know the fall of Nineveh happened by the time it had about 300,000 people in it. And the fall was so complete that the city was never rebuilt again. And so God has sent this temporary flourishing plant. And then God has sent this worm and this wind, signifying that it will one day be destroyed. And Jonah, Jonah can't see the wider plan because he's just mad currently about the plant. He doesn't understand what God is up to. He's accused God of of being too generous, too merciful. And God is saying, yes, I gave mercy here, but ultimately these people, these people who don't know their right from their left, these people who don't know good from bad, will be destroyed. And Jonah can't see it. And I think the other thing that Jonah's mad about is the destruction doesn't happen on his timeline. He wants it to be immediate. He wants it now. And I think we, as people of faith, are often guilty of demanding God work 
on our timeline. We don't understand when God moves at God's pace. And so we too are sometimes like Jonah. As I continued to sit with this text, I thought about Jonah's faith. His faith kind of reminds me of professional Christianity. That's our third P, professional. Because Jonah has all of this head knowledge about God. In chapter 3, the the king says, perhaps God will stay God's hand. Meanwhile, Jonah's like, I knew it. I knew this is who you were. Jonah quotes Exodus, this Yahweh creed that says that God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The whole time God is slow to anger, Jonah is angry, right? You get this juxtaposition of a God who does not get angry quickly and Jonah who is, as we say in my family, hopping mad, hopping mad about this. And so Jonah has all the head knowledge about who God is and he has no heart knowledge about the love of God. He cannot grasp the compassion, anger, someone points out on little Etsy signs, is only one letter removed from danger, right? It seems that anger short sights us. We, we can't step back from something. We can't see the bigger picture. And I think many of us are guilty at certain points of pr- practicing a professional type of faith where we do the thing and we read the Bible and we know the answers to give to people, and yet we we don't allow it to reach our heart. Jonah was rooting for the destruction of the Ninevites, for the entire city to be destroyed. And you might be saying, I don't root for an entire city to be destroyed. I'm not that bad, right? But I think we've all been guilty at different points of rooting for perhaps somebody to fail, of rooting for that politician we don't like to have that fall from grace, of kind of hoping we will get to see someone just beef it. We sometimes can lose sight of the compassion we are supposed to have for people. And it's particularly hard when we see people we don't think are deserving or worthy succeed or skate by, or not get the the justice we think they deserve. But the reality of it is laid out in our hymn this morning. There is a wideness in God's mercy. And we, as people of faith, assign God judgment and zeal that God will not own, God will not claim. God is a God of compassion, of loving kindness, slow to anger. And we know that that is true. So the difficult part for us is how can we, in our faith, move from knowing that creed to living that creed? How can we be real Christians, not just professional ones? As we move on from our story of Jonah, I hope something lingers with you from it. I hope you can take something from these chapters and apply them in your own life. And so as we think about it, I hope you'll think about prayer and where you are. Think about if you're taking things personally these days, or perhaps where do you need to step back and be objective? And finally, to let go of professional Christianity and invite God to renew your heart that you might be moved by compassion for, by everyone you encounter in the world. May it be so today and in the days ahead.
As we move into this time of response, I'll remind you that this is an opportunity to offer your prayers or praises, or perhaps decide to make UBC your church family officially. And so I'll invite us to stand and sing hymn number 278, We Are Travelers on a Journey. Travelers on a journey, fellow pilgrims on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Sister, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Brother, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will weep when you are weeping, when you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together of Christ's love and agony. Please receive an open-eyed benediction. May God grant you grace. Grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to know that the world is now too dangerous for anything but the truth and too small for anything but love. Please remain standing for our song benediction. <laughs> <laughs> 